Right, so in this talk, I will be describing neural program synthesis, which is basically a meta method of learning programs using some sort of optimization method. So we're going to look at how to learn logic programs in general, and then we will show how to learn them in a differentiable way. Then I'll show you some experiments and some other related work. So this is the basic outline of the talk. And then the second talk I'm going to give is going to be more sort of fun. It's going to have demos and applications to show you the kind of things that you can do with inductive logic programming. Okay, so firstly, what is neural program synthesis? That's, that's what we're going to be talking about today. Well, the general form of the task is that we're given some input-output examples. We want to learn some sort of general procedure for transforming those inputs into outputs. So a concrete example, right? The inputs are on the left, and the outputs are on the right. We want to learn some function that maps the inputs to the outputs. So in this case, we'd like it to learn, and we, and we wanted to generalize new examples it's not seen before. So we wanted to learn the length function. Or well, here, we're given as inputs lists of lists, and the output is lists of lists, and we want to chop off the last element of each list. So this is the general task. So probably you guys were in the, uh, Stephen Muggleton's ILP talks yesterday, so we're in the same area. We shall, I shall outline rough, uh, th in sketch, three different approaches to this, and then focus on the third approach, which is neural program synthesis. So the first type is symbolic program synthesis, which is the kind of stuff that Stephen Muggleton was talking about yesterday. Then we'll talk about neural program induction briefly, and then I'll focus for the rest of the talk on neural program synthesis, which is what this is really about. Okay, so symbolic program synthesis. Given some input-output examples, produce an explicit human-readable program that turns those inputs into those outputs. So we're searching in symbolic space, looking for a program. So for example, if we have these inputs and these outputs, we spit out a program. So here's the program in Haskell, here's the program in Python. So there's lots of examples of, that, of this out there. Magic Haskeller, Lambda Squared, Igor, Progol, and Metagol. I would really recommend, if you, if you want to have a play around, uh, there's Magic Haskler is, is online on the internet, and you can just um, go to the online uh, browser, enter some input-output examples, and in real time, it'll produce a function. It's really fun to play around with. I really recommend it. It works by brute force enumeration. So these are examples of symbolic program synthesis. Right, so what sort of properties does this approach have? Well, it's very data efficient, right? It can learn a program from a tiny handful of examples. So you give it like three examples or five examples, and it can learn a program. And then the thing that he has learned is human readable and interpretable, which is very good. Because it spits out right, a human readable program, we can actually verify that it's learned what we want it to learn. We can verify that it's safe. The, the program generalizes well outside the training data. So these are the good properties of symbolic program synthesis, of which inductive logic programming, which you saw yesterday, is an example. However, the, the less good qualities of it is how it handles mislabeled data and ambiguous data. So supposing some of your input-output examples are wrong. Many symbolic program synthesis methods cannot cope at all with a single wrong, ex wrong example. They are not robust at all to mislabeled data. Perhaps more seriously, for the sort of applications I'm interested in, they are not robust to ambiguous data. So what do I mean by ambiguous data? Well, the standard ILP techniques assume that you're given discrete, crisp inputs, you know, alphanumeric characters, and not fuzzy stuff. So supposing you're a, a robot with a camera, and you're just looking around, and you see some thing, images of, of digits, whatever, but you're not quite sure, you're not quite sure what image it is. You don't know if it, you have some distribution over what... Um, image it is, but you don't know for sure. So symbolic program synthesis methods are unable to cope in this sort of situation where the input they're given is ambiguous and fuzzy. So the second type of approach... I'm sorry? Um, 
the, the input that they expect is crisp, discrete input, not uh, fuzzy input. Well, what, what, what I mean is you, you can't feed them in an MNIST, a fuzzy MNIST image like this. You need to give them explicit alphanumeric symbols. Uh, the, sim, the, symbol, the standard ILP systems I've seen don't want um, continuous numbers. They operate with discrete input. Well, I mean, I don't know any symbolic program synthesis system w which has the property you're describing, but maybe in principle they could. Thank you. Okay, so, so a second group is neural program induction. So here we have a neural network learning a general procedure for mapping the inputs to the outputs. Here we have a, a latent representation of the program. So we don't, we're not spitting out an explicit program that we can read. The, pro, the procedure is just implicit in the weights of this model. So here are some examples of this type of thing. There's differentiable neural computers or the neural stacks, neural program interpreters, and neural GPUs. So the differentiable neural computer, for example, is a type of LSTM that has an external memory where it can read and write to that memory via a differentiable attention mechanism. Similarly, the neural stack or queue also has an external memory, but it's restricted to be a push-down stack, and its push and pop operations also work via a differentiable attention mechanism. The neural programmer interpreter, again, is a kind of LSTM. This time, it's not just given input-output examples, but it's actually given the explicit trace of what the algorithm did. And a neural GPU is a differentiable model of a cellular automaton, more or less. So what all these things have in common is they take, they take some virtual machine, they take some model of computation, like a Turing machine or a cellular automaton or pushdown or automaton or whatever, and then they provide a differentiable implementation of that, and then they learn a procedure which is implicit in the weights of that neural <coughs> network model. So if we look at the, the properties of this group of systems, so... These systems are not very data efficient, right? They need thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of examples before they will learn the right kind of program that you want them to learn. So they're not very data efficient at all. They are, however, and they're also not at all interpretable, right? You can't read off what the program is that they've learned. All, all you get is this matrix of weights. What do you do with that? Sometimes they generalize well outside their training data, but that's not guaranteed. But the things about which they're very strong is they're robust to mislabeled data, and they're also robust to ambiguous data, fuzzy data, data from a camera. Okay, so that's two approaches. So what we'd like, of course, right, is the best of both worlds, because what's interesting about the two approaches we've seen so far is that they have complementary strengths and weaknesses. So symbolic program synthesis, SPS, which is what inductive logic programming is an example of, has these two weaknesses about uh, basically mislabeled and ambiguous data. But that's the strength of neural program induction methods. So what we'd really like, of course, in a perfect world, is something that meets all these desiderata. We want something that's data efficient and interpretable, generalizes well, is robust to mislabeled data and to ambiguous data. Okay, so that's what neural program synthesis is trying to be. It's trying to satisfy all our desiderata. Okay, so we're given some input-output examples. We're going to produce an explicit human-readable program that, when evaluated on the inputs, produces the outputs. And we're going to use some optimization method, for example, stochastic gradient descent, to find that program. So examples of this is the differentiable ILP stuff that we've done, and robust fill, and differentiable fourth, and end-to-end -end differentiable proving from UCL. These are some examples of this kind of approach. So in terms of a square of possible approaches, right, we're going to be focusing on neural program synthesis, in which it generates an explicit procedure using an optimization. Uh, 
Okay. Right, so learning logic programs. So when we are um, in the job of program synthesis, right, obviously a very important first question to ask is what sort of target language should we be synthesizing in? Now, the kind of considerations that we bear in mind when deciding what language hum we as humans are going to program in may well be a, a very different set of considerations from the considerations that we take into account uh, when we want the computer to synthesize programs. So I want to claim opinion piece here that the main two features of a target language for program synthesis is that it's pure and that it's expressive. We want it to be referentially transparent. So as I'm sure you all know, a, lang a language is referentially transparent if whenever A and B are denotationally equivalent, then you can replace one by the other and the programs will be the same. So most procedural languages, most languages people use out there for real applications are not referentially transparent. Haskell is. Outside the state mode, whatever. Outside the IO mode. Okay, and this is, why is this important for program synthesis? Why do we care about referential transparency? Well, it, well because it means we can take some chunk and replace it with some other chunk, and we can create equivalence classes of functions which do exactly the same thing, thereby searching over these equivalence classes, and the search space can be drastically reduced. So referential transparency is um, a very nice feature to have for program synthesis. The second very important feature for program synthesis right, is the expressiveness, <coughs> expressiveness of the language, how sh short the program is that it can express as much as possible. Because effectively, we're searching through the space of programs. Let's say we have some branching factor b, and our program is of length n. So our search is b to the n. If we can minimize n more than anything else, that's going to keep the search space tractable. So my opinionated claim is that the languages on the left are good target languages for program synthesis, and the languages on the right are less optimal. So Python and C++ are not good languages for program synthesis because they're not referentially transparent. Things like combinatory logic and on suboptimal choices because of the length of the program. So, so I believe that Datalog is a particularly good target language for program synthesis because it's both referentially transparent and also highly expressive. So here's a concrete example. So this is uh, the number of lines of code for some static program analysis. And in the left column, the hand-coded column, is how many lines of code was needed to write the analysis in Java. And on the right column is how many lines of code were needed for exactly the same thing when the lines of code were written in Datalog. And as you can see, it's sometimes two orders of magnitude more efficient, more uh, shorter, which I think is nice. So, so Datalog is a very expressive language, and therefore, in my opinion, an ideal target language for program synthesis. Okay, so probably most of you know this, but uh, so I'm not going to go into this in detail, but just in, just in case there's a couple of you who don't know what data log is, I'm just going to sketch the basic idea, right? So a data log is a type of logic programming language, a bit like Prolog. In fact, it's syntactically a restricted subset of Prolog, which involves two types of facts. So we have an extensional database, which is a set of ground atoms. So for example, here, here's some ground atoms. And also, it's a set of clauses, first-order clauses, def definite clauses. We read the clauses from right to left. So the top clause here says that for all x and all y, if there's an edge between x and y, then x and y are connected. The, the second clause, um, variables that appear on the right but not on the left are x essentially quantified. So the, the second clause says... If there exists some z, such as an edge from x to z, and z is connected to y, then x is connected to y. So this is data log. Okay, so we're going to focus, right, on standard data log, right? Definite clauses. We're not going to allow disjunctions or existential quantification in the head of the clauses. So when we execute a data log program, we, we start with a set of rules, and we, we just the, the most simple and naive execution strategy is just to repeatedly apply those rules until no more consequences can be derived. So for example, 
If we have the program here at the top, where we have a set of ground atoms and we have a set of rules, then we start off with just the ground atoms. Then we apply the rules at stage two to create the first group of connected atoms. Then we apply transitively to, to stage three and then stage four. And at that point, we reach a fixed point. But we're not generating any more new conclusions. And that is all the consequences. So in data log, if we've got a set of clauses and a set of ground atoms, there's one unique set, which is the consequences. So that's naive bottom-up evaluation, but there are, of course, much more efficient ways of executing data log. There's the semi-naive approach, where we keep track of what the new atoms are that have been added to the database. And there's magic sets, where we actually use knowledge of the query of what it is that we're trying to evaluate. So we only perform a subset of the actual inferences, the ones we care about. Okay, so to compare data log with prologue, data log is syntactically a, a subset, but it has a nice property of being purely declarative. So in prologue, I'm sure you guys know this, if you reorder the clauses or the literals within a clause, it can make all the difference between terminating and not terminating. Whereas data log is purely declarative. You can switch things around as much as you like. And, it's, and it has. Also, data log programs are guaranteed to terminate, which is a nice property. Okay, so I'm just trying to sell data log as, a, as an ideal target language for program synthesis. So, as I'm sure Stephen described to you yesterday, an ILP problem is a, is a triple. So, we have a set B of background assumptions, which is a set of ground atoms. We have a set of positive instances and we have a set of negative instances. So for example, let's say we're trying to learn the even um, predicate. So in our background, we're just given the most simple definition of the natural numbers. We're told what zero is and we're told the successor relation. And then in our positive examples, we're given a small handful of, of instances of positive num of even numbers. And in our negative examples, n, we're given a handful of examples of things that are not even. So once we have our ILP problem, a solution is a set of these definite clauses, a set R of clauses, such that when we combine B and R, we entail all our positive examples, and we don't entail any of our negative examples. OK. So concretely, in our example of even here, here is um, a program which satisfies the positive examples and doesn't satisfy any of the negative examples. Even this program in some ways is not entirely trivial because it has recursion. And it also has this suck to relation which it had to invent. So what this program is saying, right, is a number is even if it's zero. <coughs> And also, a number is even if there exists some y which has this successor to relation to x. And this successor to relation is, is an invented predicate, which just means that x and y are too different from each other. So this is perhaps the simplest, one of the simplest examples to illustrate the two hard properties of um, program synthesis, which is synthesizing recursive functions and learning <coughs> Invented predicates. Like, it's often in data log, the only way you can solve a program is by introducing invented predicates. Okay. So, okay, so how to do this? How are we going to learn these logic programs from examples? Um, so the question is about the size of the input and output examples. Right, so, so the, the sets are finite in all the applications I know about, and they tend to be very, not just finite, but rather small. So often a handful of examples. The systems I've seen often have like five examples. This, this number of examples is not unrealistic. 
So you, you only, that, that's one of the beauties of program synthesis is you give it a small handful of examples and with the right inductive bias, it will learn the right function. What is the complexity of the program? Well, it depends on the systems. So um, we will see, uh, I'll, I'll outline a few different systems. Um, so until only a few years ago, no systems could learn recursive uh, programs or programs with invented predicates, of which this is an example here. N now there are a few examples like Metagol and this system which I will describe today, a few which can learn recursive programs and programs with invented predicates. But still, to be honest, the, we're talking about moderately small sized programs uh, that tend to have at most five to ten clauses in. <coughs> That's the kind of size. So the, the kind of programs people learn when they produce, when they're, they're learning how to program. So we certainly are not producing huge hundred line programs. Okay, so there are two broad classes of approaches to ILP. One is bottom-up and one is top-down. So the bottom-up approaches, like Progol and Aleph, what they do is they look at the actual positive and negative examples and try and generalize from them. Using theta subsumption, they get more and more general clauses. However, the existing and bottom-up approaches are not able to learn recursive clauses or generate invented predicates. The top-down approaches, like Metagol and Aspal, are able to. So this is a real significant innovation in the last few years. I'm going to focus on a particular top-down approach called Aspal from Karapi and others. The basic idea is to transform the program induction problem into a SAP problem. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to define a rule template as a way of defining a set of clauses and then have a program template which is a set of rule templates. This is, this is going to constrain the set of programs that we're generating. And then for each rule template, we're going to generate a set of clauses that satisfy that template. We're going to introduce flags which turn on and off those clauses. And now the induction problem has been transformed into a satisfiability problem. The idea is to find an assignment to the flags such that the set of clauses that are on together entail the positive examples and don't entail the negative examples. So hopefully this will make more sense. So a rule template just, is just a pair with two elements in it. The V is just how many existentially quantified variables are in the clause. And int is a flag indicating whether the atoms in the body of the clause are allowed to use intentional predicates or whether they can just use the extensional predicates. So a concrete example, right? If we're not allowed any existentially quantified variables and we're not allowed to use any intentional predicates, then if we want to define a binary relation Q and our intentional predicate is P, these are all and only the clauses that satisfy this rule template. And... Now, if we have one existentially quantified variable and we are allowed to use intentional predicates in, the, in our body, now we have many more clauses that we, are, that we generate. So, so here, V equals 1 means we can have at most one existentially quantified variable. So, for example, Z here is existentially quantified. And intentional equals 1 means we're allowed to have intentional predicates, but we don't have to. Okay, so we're going to have a set of flags, right, indicating which of these clauses are on and off, effectively, right? So F subscript I superscript J indicates whether the jth clause of the i template is to be in our program or not. And we insist that exactly one flag is turned on for each template. So now the set of rules we're looking for, right, is just a set of clauses corresponding to the flags that are turned on. 
So that is the approach. Basically, we have a rule template which specifies a range of clauses. We have a flag indicating which clauses are turned on and off. And now we've transformed our induction problem into a satisfiability problem. So this is one way of doing program synthesis. Hey, Henry. Uh, you, you, sorry, which bit? You mean translating it into SAT? The, oh, the translation process. Um, well, it depends on... It dep it's a... It's going to be a large polynomial function of the number of intentional predicates, the number of extensional predicates, and the, <coughs> and the variables in the different um, rule templates. But I think it's going to be a large polynomial function of those things. Thanks, Henrik. OK, so obviously there's a, a huge number right, of, of possible clauses. And we, we don't want to consider all of them. So we make various restrictions on the set of clauses without any loss of generality so that we can transform this into something that can work in a neural network. So first of all, we insist that all clauses have exactly two atoms in the body. So we can make that um, restriction without loss of generality. We also insist that each predicate is defined by two clauses. And again, we can make that restriction without loss of generality by introducing other intermediate predicates and other clauses. We also make other restrictions. We don't allow any constants in our rules, right? So all our rules are entirely universally quantified. This also massively restricts the search space. And we limit ourselves to predicates of arity at most two. So we have nullary predicates, unary predicates, binary predicates, but no ternary predicates. This is the major restriction of the system that I'm going to describe to you is that predicates are at most arity two. This is because of the memory restrictions that this method that we, I would describe has. Okay, so next I'll describe the way in which we trans... So, so far, I've just described to you a simple method of converting ILP into a sat satisfiability problem. Next, I'm going to describe how to neuralize this. So, if you've got some computer... Um, algorithm, neuralizing it is basically to transform it into some set of differentiable um, operations so that we can apply gradient descent. Yes? Uh, going back to the slides where we have the, uh, you said that um, the clauses are defined by two atoms. Yeah. Um, so you said that we need not, uh, you can do for arbitrary many uh, new variables, but can we get more than three or four at all? Because you have only two clauses. That's right. That's true. That's so true. We can restrict that's true. I, I never said there was an arbitrary number of existential variables. But you said there was an arbitrary number of what? I'm sorry, I don't remember what I said there was an uh, arbitrary. I'm not sure. So what is V? What is V? Okay, so V is the number of existentially quantified variables, which, as you say correctly, is at most two. And int, int is a flag indicating whether or not we're allowed to use intentional predicates in the body of our rules. It basically defines things like whether we're allowed to have recursive clauses, amongst other things. Thank, thank you. No, that's cool. I'm so, thank you for clarifying. Okay. So, okay. so what I did then was just describe a simple method for transforming induction problem into a satisfiability problem. And now we're going to neuralize this. We are, so neuralizing something is to take some existing algorithm and transform it into a set of differentiable operations and apply some optimization procedure like gradient descent. So now we're going to look at differentiable logic programming. We're going to replace these non-differentiable operations with differentiable operations on continuous values. OK, so differentiable ILP, pronounced DILP, which is not a very good name. So if you guys have got a better name, please tell me, is, um, is a method of inducing logic programs from um, using gradient descent. So we, we start at the bottom. 
So we have here our, this is our background knowledge. This is our, our program template, which is our set of rule templates. So from our axioms, we convert into a thing called evaluation. From our program template and our language definition, we generate a set of clauses. For each clause, we have some weight, which indicates how much we believe it's true. And then we infer, using our, back, our initial assumptions and our clauses, in a differentiable way, what our conclusions are. And then we extract from our conclusions the particular set of atoms we're interested in, and then we compare those atoms with the predicted labels, with the true labels, and take the cross-entropy loss. And then because this system is differentiable, we can propagate the error back from the top, going all the way down, and modify our clause weights. So that's the basic approach. I would explain some more detail, but that's the basic idea. Right, so making everything continuous. So instead of having a, a set of ground atoms, we now have a valuation, which is a vector of floating point numbers between 0 and 1, indicating the probability that these ground atoms are true. So we also include, so imagine we've just got these four ground atoms plus the fulsome atom. We always need the fulsome atom as like a sort of null pointer. And we insist that the fulsome atom is always false. So instead of having a, a set of discrete ground atoms, we now have a valuation, which is a vector of continuous floating point numbers between 0 and 1 representing probabilities. So now the key idea of how this system works is that each clause... Each definite clause is transformed, compiled, into a function from valuations to valuations. So this is the key technique for how this approach works. So as a concrete example, right, if we have this very, very simple clause which says, if Q of X, then P of X, and if this is our input valuation here, then we can transform this clause into a function that turns this valuation into this valuation. Right, so all these different clauses are being applied. Each then produces its own valuation. Now we have a set of weights indicating how likely it is we think those different clauses are in our program. That's W. So now we use our weights together with our valuations and combine them together using softmax. So BT here, so C are all our different clauses, and FC is our function which takes a valuation and produces a new valuation. And then we're just weighting the different valuations using softmax. But we also have our previous time step, the, all the things we thought were true before. Now we need to amalgamate the previous time step with the new time step, and we do that using the probabilistic sum. Now, of course, when we're doing this kind of logical inference, right, it's not okay to do this for one, just one step. We're um, executing um, recursive functions and stuff, so we, we need to unroll this for a certain number of steps of forward chaining inference. And because it's being done well, the way we do it, we fix that number. So we just unroll for a set T steps of forward chaining inference. Right, uh, that's a good question. So we fix it in the definition of the problem, which is not ideal. A better thing to do would be to uh, keep doing it. That's a real issue that we... Thanks, Nathan. Yeah. Currently, currently, the way we specify T is suboptimal. Okay, so now maybe this diagram makes more sense. So, so this valuation here, right, is this vector of floating point numbers. So we have a differentiable version of forward chaining inference, which, which allows us to take our clauses and our clause weights and create a conclusion valuation by iterating through for t time steps. And then we can extract our value, take the cross-entropy loss, 
and then we can back propagate through these differentiable operations and modify our clause weights. And that gives us an idea of what the program is. Okay. So now, this is the key part of how forward chaining inference is, is done in a differentiable way. So I'm going to go into a little bit of detail about it. Okay, so we've got our clause, for example, nice simple clause here, and we want to compile it into a function from valuations to valuations. How do we do that? Okay. So remember that we are restricting all clauses to have two atoms in the body. So the first thing we do, which we do before we... This is all at compile time, if you like. This is the point at which we're compiling into a neural network. We calculate for each ground atom all the pairs of ground atoms that contribute to its truth. So, for example, if we have this rule here, that if PXZ and QZY, then RXY, then these are all the witnesses, all these pairs. This pair, if this pair was true, then this would be true. Or if this pair was true, then this would be true. And we have a set of these pairs, which are all the possible witnesses to the truth of these ground atoms. How many such pairs there are, right, is a function of the number of existentially quantified variables in the clause. In fact, it's the number of constants in the Herbrand unit, the number of constants to the power of the number of existentially quantified variables. Okay, so we, we calculate this table. Then we convert these pairs of atoms into pairs of indices. Okay, so concretely, again, if we have this rule here like this, So, so for example, RAA depends on 1, 5, and 2, 7, right? And 1, 5 just is PAA and QAA. So that pair of in indices represents a pair of atoms. Okay. Right, so next, we just gather up our different uh, arrays of indices into tensors. So here, W is, like I say, it's the number of constants to the power of the number of existential quantified variables. I'm sorry? Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Thank you. N is the number of uh, ground atoms in the Herbrand base. N is the number of ground atoms in the Herbrand base, and W is the number of constants to the power number of extension quantum variables. So this is quite large operations to be performing. So now I will go explain this in a bit more detail, but basically we split our tensor into two matrices, we gather up the results, we take the element-wise products, and then we take the maximum across the second dimension. Why do we take the maximum? Well, because RAA is true if this pair is true or this pair is true. So we're going to take the maximum of this conjunction for, e for, e for each of these pairs. Okay, so concretely, we've got our example rule again, right? If PXZ and QZY, then RXY. We're given, we're given this valuation here, AK, and we're going to compute this FC of AK. So this is the function that corresponds to that clause. And how do we, how do we compute that function? So I'll just take one example, right? So this particular value for RAB is 0 0.72. So how does it get that value? Well, this is the, the ground rule corresponding to the top rule. So we look at the value of PAB, and we look at the value of QBB. These are their indices. These are their corresponding values. And then we multiply them together. So this is going to have a whole row of them, and we take the max, because we're doing all. So this is like a probabilistic version. This is a differentiable-ish version of all. This is how we compute all. 
Uh, yes. Should the second uh, element of array be a constant because it is larger than the other one? Yeah, we're taking the max. Because effectively, we're, we're, this is disjunction. We're, we're saying that RAB is true if any of these pairs of witnesses are true. So just to go back to this thing. Yeah, RAB is true if any of these pairs are true. And, and so we're finding the pair that has the maximum value. So, well, we, we start off with this value. This is basically, if you like, a continuous um, implementation of a set of ground atoms. This is basically our assumptions. But probabilistically, you know, this, this is how likely we think it is. This value says, oh, I think it's not 0.8 probable this atom is true. So we start off with one valuation, and then we compute another valuation. And each clause is transformed into its own function. Okay, so some experiments, which may be a bit more. Uh, yes? Um, why, why can't you take into consideration the best probability as well? I mean, couldn't you add some additional probability from those two? Yes, you could. There are other ways of doing this. There are other ways of doing continuous relaxations of disjunction. Absolutely. Yeah. But this was one that we found was effective. We actually tried a number of experiments with different ways of doing conjunction and disjunction as T norms and co T norms. We found this one gave the best results. But you're absolutely right that, that there's a whole set of design decisions about exactly which one to use. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right, Nathan. Okay, so we tried a lot of experiments to verify this system works. So to start with, we took some standard ILP um, experiments. So some of them are from arithmetic, some of them are from lists, some are from family trees, and some are from graphs. And uh, we... We use Metagol as our baseline because Metagol is the system Stephen described yesterday, state-of-the-art ILP system. A number of these require recursion and predicate invention. So these are non-trivial problems for the ILP community. At the time at which we did these tests, Metagol couldn't do all of the ones that we could do, but since then, they fixed a couple of bugs and now they can do them all quite happily. So, for example, graphs, graph cyclicity, right? So, we're given a few examples of graphs. A handful of examples, right? Literally, these, three, these are the examples that we used. And they're directed graphs. We, um, we have our edges. And then we label some of the nodes if they're involved in a cycle as green. So, all the green nodes are involved in a cycle. And all the blue nodes are not involved in a cycle. And we want the system to learn what is the special property of these green nodes. What does it mean to be involved in a cycle? And our differentiable ILP system chugs away a bit, gradient descent, the loss is going down, and at the end, it spits out this logic program. Or rather, we can read off the logic program from the weights. And what this program says is that um, x is involved in a cycle, i.e. x is green, if x has this predicate relation to itself. And this predicate relation is an example of an invented predicate. So it's like an auxiliary function which is invented. And that, and that pred relation, of course, is just a transitive closure of the edge relation, which is just the connected relation. So what it's learnt is the simple program that says that x is involved in a cycle if x is connected to itself. So this involves all the key hard concepts of program synthesis, recursion and predicate invention. Now obviously it's a very simple program. Oh, Naif. <coughs> Right, so whenever, it's, whenever it 
if it converges on a, a good solution with a very low loss, then if you look at the entropy of the probability distribution over the weights, it's very, very low. So you, now you can just take all the ones above some arbitrary threshold and count those. Basically, it puts all its probability mass on three clauses, and all the rest are almost zero. So we just have some arbitrary threshold, we filter, we take the best ones, and bang, and that's our program. That's right. Sometimes if it has failed to find a good solution, if it's, for example, found a local minimum, which does happen quite a lot of the time, then there's a, the entropy of the weight distribution is extremely high, and it's just a sort of fuzzy mixture, and it isn't really sure which rules it is. But when it finds a solution, it finds a low entropy solution. So I don't know if you know this example. This is a very amusing example from, um, from a blog post a couple of years ago now by a guy called Joel Groose, I think his name is. And the idea was that he was going for a job interview and they said, we want you to do um, a standard software engineer test of solving FizzBuzz. And we want you to write this in Python. So do you guys know FizzBuzz? FizzBuzz is a children's game where you enumerate the natural numbers so one, two, three, four, five, whatever. But whenever the number divides by three, you have to say fizz. And if it divides by five, you have to say bus. So Joel Groose was um, in this job interview. And he was asked to write a program that, that did this. But instead of doing it in a conventional way, he decided to write a machine learning program that would solve um, fizz buzz for him. So he, so he gave it a, a neural network. So he gave it a load of training data, examples like this. But in fact, he, get, he trained it on numbers between 100 and 1,000. He held out from numbers from 0 to 100 as, as test numbers. And he gave it a fully connected multi-layer perceptron. So for that, you have to actually write the program. Yes, he wrote a simple TensorFlow multi-layer perceptron, exactly. And he gave it all this training data, exactly, yes. And so... Now, the results on this, when you held out, the, so the numbers from 1 to 100 had never seen. It had been trained on numbers 100 to 1,000. It had never seen numbers from 1 to 100. But its, but its performance on the test numbers, 1 to 100, was not much better than uh, random, unfortunately. The multi-layer perception was unable to generalize. It hadn't really grasped the concept of FizzBuzz at all. It had sort of memorized some sort of fuzzy memorization, but it hadn't really learned the real concept of FizzBuzz. So we took that as a real challenge, like, can a neural network learn FizzBuzz? And so that is really what we spent all this, no, that's not true. <laughs> but it certainly was one of the motivating things was, can we have a neural network that learns FizzBuzz and really generalizes properly outside the training data? So, so this, is the, um, this is the training data, well, we actually gave it a subset of this. The, and this is the first part of the program. This is the Fizz. So a Fizz number is a number that divides by three. So, and what this uh, program is saying is that, well, a number is a fizz number if it's zero, or it's a fizz number, or x is a fizz number if, if there exists some y, which is a fizz number, which is related by the pred1 relation. And the pred1 relation is another of these invented predicates. And the pred1 relation is, is the successor of the pred2 relation, and the pred2 relation is the successor by two. So effectively, the pred1 relation between x and y means that x is three... Uh, smaller than y. And so what it has learned here is what it is to be divisible by 3. This is the invented predicates that it has used. Right now, one of the nice things about inductive logic program systems is that when they've learned something in one task, you can take the stuff they've learned which is in like a readable program, and copy and paste it and use it in your new task. So, and we use exactly that functionality here. So the pred1 and the pred2 relations, we learned from the fizz task, and now it's going to use them in the buzz task. So now a, a number is a buzz number if it's divisible by five. And what it's learned here is that a number is a buzz number if it's zero, or it has the pred3 relation to some other buzz number. And the pred3 relation is recognizably what it is for two numbers to be five numbers apart. So what it's done here is it has learned the um, divisible by five relation. So finally, a neural network has been able to um, learn FizzBuzz. And now this, this program will generalize to numbers of any size. So unlike neural networks, there's always a slight danger that at some point 
it will stop generalizing. This system, this program will you know, work on it, data of any size. Okay, so the types of system like Metagol have a real issue when they're given mislabeled training data. Many of these systems, if they're given a single piece of mislabeled training data, they fail catastrophically. Whereas our system, because it's based on uh, minimizing loss, handles mislabeled data very uh, nice and robustly. So what we did is we took a certain proportion row of our training examples and we willfully and naughtily mislabeled those examples. And we ran experiments for different values of row. Right, so here's six of our experiments. These are six of our standard ILP tasks. And what's on the x-axis is how much of the, um, how, what proportion of the training examples were willfully and naughtily mislabeled. And the thing that I want to um, uh, emphasize is that with a certain proportion of mislabeled training examples, the system is still very robust and is able to learn the right program. And even when we start increasing the amount of mislabeled training examples, more significantly, it degrades gracefully. So if we imagine a generalization of these bugs with three, five, um, 1,013, yes. um, it's an interesting question whether it's a feature or a bug of your system <coughs> that might chuck away the 1,013 factor as uh, mislabeled data. Um. I don't understand your example. So are you saying as training data, you're, as training data, you're taught that 1,013 has this special property? Yes, yeah, so if we have this buzz pop or something. Right. So, and, and you're saying that you, as training data, you give it examples of pop? Yeah, but it's a much smaller, small number. Oh. I mean, this is, this is not a hostile question. It's either a feature or a bug, but, you know, small signals could just be thrown away yeah. because that's right. That's, thank you. That's right. That is exactly it's somewhere in the intermediate area between a feature and a bug. Uh, yes, that is a consequence. If I had a tiny number of that, are those examples? OK, so as well as um, mislabeled data, right, there's ambiguous data. So symbolic program synthesis systems, to my knowledge, do not work when they are given fuzzy data. It's the wrong kind of input for them. What they want is a discrete set of ground atoms. What they don't know how to cope with is fuzzy images. So what we are going to um, look at here is learning rules from completely um, ambiguous data from raw images. So here we're trying to learn the less than relation, which is a nice simple thing to learn, but we're not given discrete numerals, we're given MNIST images which are fuzzy and different every time. So for example, you know, so, we, we, so this is a classification problem. We're given two images and we're told, and we need to output a one if the left image represents a number that's less than the right image. Okay, so this is our training data. Lots of examples like this. And we're trying to learn the less than relation on raw pixel input. Okay. Now, we, we want it to do two types of generalization. We want it to do um, image generalization. So what I mean, Im image generalization, right? It, if it's seen this two and this four, and it knows that that two is less than this four, and now it sees a slightly different drawing of a two and a slightly different drawing of a four, then it should be able to generalize, right? Image generalization. Neural networks are very good at image generalization. Excellent idea. But we also want it to do symbolic generalization. So for example, if it's seen that two is less than three and it's seen three is less than four, and it has some general feeling that this less than relation is transitive, but it's never seen this particular pair of um, integers, then it should generalize and think that two is less than four. Even if it's seen no examples whatsoever of two being less than four in any of its training. 
That's what we'd really like it to do. Now, neural networks are not so good at this type of problem. So, if the neural network has seen, so this is all the possible less sounds between you know, 0 to 9. If a neural network has seen lots of examples of every single one of these elements, then it can learn the less-than relation just fine, because it's very good at generalizing from images to other images. However, if we start taking some of these elements and taking them away, the neural network is no longer able to generalize effectively. Now, you and I, well, you and I, it's difficult for us because we already know the less-than relation. But if we were given some other relation, and if we saw lots and lots of examples like this, we would start to get a strong suspicion that the relation was transitive and therefore fill in the things we couldn't see. OK. So we created a multi-layer perceptron to solve this task, right? So this is a standard neural network that's given these images and has to output these labels. It's trained on cross-entropy loss. Now, if we give it every single one of these, um, if we give it lots of examples of, e of every single one of these, it can solve the task quite well, as we'd expect it to. It, it can solve a task easily. However, as we start to take away examples, the neural network degrades more and more, because it, doesn't, it isn't able to generalize symbolically. The more examples that we take away, the less well the standard neural network will perform. However, so, but, but then we tried our differentiable ILP system on the same task. So we made a slight modification to our architecture. So this is the architecture I, I've been describing to you guys before. So our changes, so before we had this set of axioms, which is just a set of ground atoms so converted into an initial valuation. And now we have a simple convolutional neural network basically looking at those pixel images and turning it into a valuation. And then combining this with the other assumptions and creating a valuation. So that's the only bit that's different. Basically, we plugged a convolutional neural network in to the input of our system. And this is the uh, program that our system learned. It says, well, output a one, if the image two has this, pro um, if, if x is the right image and x satisfies the invented pred one predicate. And the pred one predicate looks at the left image and, the, and tests the pred two predicate. And then the pred two predicate is recognizably the less than relation. So the program it's, it's spat out is exactly, we're going to emit a one if the left image is less than the right image. Okay, so and this is the crucial graph. So our baseline, right, is our standard neural network. Um, our system is the green system, the differentiable ILP system. And on the x-axis is the proportion of pairs that we held out from training. So, so how many of these examples we held out? How much of this stuff we held out? Okay. And as you can see, the standard neural network just degrades almost linearly. Because effectively, if it hasn't seen some, if it hasn't seen some elements in here, it doesn't know what to do. Our system, by contrast, because it has a strong inductive bias towards recursive f programs and to things like transitive closure, it is able to learn the correct program even when it's seen less than half of the examples. Okay, so this is early days. This is really a proof of concept. So the whole field of um, uh, program synthesis is at a very early stage. I think it's a very exciting area, but it's also very um, a very infant area. And, hello. Yeah, that's a very good question. The question is, did we first pre-train the convolutional neural network, or did it do end-to-end -end learning of the recognition of the images as well as the lesson at the same time? That's a good, right, so 
and we pre-trained it. But then what we did is we looked not at the final output, but at the final his and layer and had a mapping from there. What we would like to do in further work, we couldn't get it to work in the first instance, is have the whole thing learning end to end. In principle, this kind of system should be able to do that. And, and that is one of the potential selling points of it. But in our first experiments, we didn't manage to get it to do that. Thanks. Yeah, so um, uh, program synthesis, I think, is um, a discipline which is in its early stages. I think it's very exciting, but many of the systems can only generate small programs. And this system that I've been describing is no exception. It has a number of limitations, the main ones of which are local minima and memory use. So it's, it's working by stochastic gradient descent, and it starts off with some random, random initialization for the weights of how probable it thinks the different clauses are. And gradient descent, minimizing the loss, eventually um, it converges to some kind of value. But we found that often only a certain proportion of the runs would find the right program. And speaking to people on the ground who are also doing neural systems like this, everyone says the same. So the Microsoft research guys who did a thing called Terpret, they say the same thing. Tim Rockdeshell and the UCL people who did the differentiable theorem proof, they say the same thing too. So all these neural network systems at the moment that, that learn programs get stuck in local minima most of the time. So what you're doing is effectively rolling the dice. Like with some um, configuration, initial configuration of weights, it will find the program that you're hoping it will find, but not always, or in fact, not often. So that's a, a real issue with this field at the moment. And the second major uh, limitation of our system is it uses a huge amount of memory, which stops, stops, prevents us being able to learn very large and complex programs. So, so in some ways, it's, it's more like um, a dog walking on its hind legs. It's not that it does it well, it's just cool that it can do it at all kind of thing. It's like... Uh, uh, can you quantify a huge amount of memory? Uh, yes, so these are the numbers for the amount of memory it uses as a function of various things. But, well, it's using many, many gigabytes to do what you might think of as quite simple, to find quite simple programs. So, but this memory is, uh, is used in the sense that the graph is large, the computation on graph is large? Yeah. Or, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. The graph itself can just is in gigabytes. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah, well, the total memory use is in gigabytes, yeah. But then obviously, uh, learning the learning problems is difficult. So you can learn, um, you can learn to do eventually, you can learn small tasks. Yeah. Just remember when you showed us uh, yesterday with Pentagon that uh, a larger program became much smaller and much faster to learn thanks to the invention when uh, the Pentagon were invented. Yes. No, that's a good point. I, I haven't tried that, but that, that's an excellent way of scaling the systems up. That's right. It's basically we're compiling every one of these clauses into a separate function. And each of those functions creates all these different valuations. And then we have all these valuations over all these different time steps. So it's just a huge, in each valuation, right, is the size of the number of ground atoms. So the whole thing is just, it's performing a huge amount of computation. Can you estimate the number of parameters? How many parameters you are learning? Well, okay, so this, this formula here is basically one of the key amounts of memory that's used. So, so what this is saying, so n is the number of ground atoms in our Herb Brown base, t is our number of time steps, p is the number of predicates, and then this is how, and then this is the number of clauses that we're generating. So th this quickly becomes large. Okay, so quickly related, oh, hello, Dave. There's, there's, but there's no guarantee they'll be minimal. But in practice, are they effectively good? Like, for instance, you showed us that for the least, so uh, you kind of reuse the print T. Yes. So will this kind of happen? Yes, you can, you can often reuse predicates, but it is, um, 
when machines are searching through the space of programs, they, they often find programs that seem very unintuitive to me. So when I was first running the system and debugging it, a, a number of the programs that it, it found for that less than example were very unintuitive to me. And I thought that they were actually bugs and there was something wrong with the system, but it had very, very low entropy. It, it, it seemed very confident that this was a program, but yet when I looked at it, it seemed utterly bizarre. It was just like a five clause logic program, and it had learned a very, very bizarre way of computing less than. And once I actually hand executed it a number of times and then ran it on large numbers, I, I saw that it was correct, but it, it certainly isn't the way that I would do it or I think you would do it. So, there, so certainly you can sometimes extract useful um, things that it's learned and reuse them, but sometimes it's, it's learned things that make sense to it but don't make as much sense to us. Okay, so, so we'll quickly just talk about a little bit of related work, just quickly. So here's one way of, of distinguishing between deduction, abduction, and induction. You guys will probably know this already, but supposing we've got a set A of ground atoms and a set A prime of ground atoms and a set of first order rules. Then in deduction, right, well, we're given a set of rules and we're given a set of atoms and we want to find the consequences of those atoms. In abduction, we're given a set of rules and a set of consequences, and we want to find the original atoms from which we deduce those consequences. And in induction, right, we're given our original atoms, and we've got our consequences, and we want to find a set of rules that we can use to deduce the consequences. Well, this is a super high-level way of distinguishing, right, these three fundamental types of operation. And I'll just quickly give you an overview of ways in which people have done all these three things using neural networks. Yeah, so, so we, sorry, so we, I do, one of my test examples is learning less than on discrete data. And it, it's, a, it's a much simpler problem. Uh, well, in, in this setup, it, it's a, it requires a smaller program because you don't need to learn the extra clauses to do with which, your, which the two images are. But yeah, we did try that. And certainly, it, it, it learns it very effectively. The, thank you. Okay, so we've got deduction, abduction, induction. I'm just going to quickly sketch ways in which neural networks can be used to do all three of those things. So this was the first example, to my knowledge, of using neural networks to do first-order deduction. And I think it, I found it inspiring when I read it, but it's, it's sort of highly theoretical, as in it doesn't suggest a practical algorithm. But basically, all they do is they say, well, we've got a set G of ground atoms, and then they define a function that takes some arbitrary subset of ground atoms and maps it to a single real number. So imagine we have this operator, the, the, the basically this, this operator here around G that takes each atom and turns it into an integer. Then, then their function for converting a set of ground atoms into a single float is this. In fact, this will work with any number it doesn't have to be four to the power minus, it could be three, it could be any number larger than two. It, can't, it doesn't work for two because when it's two, it's not an injective function. And then they define the inverse of this function, r to the minus one. And they show that, that and now sorry, tp, this is the standard um, deduction operator on a set of atoms. So now this is a continuous function on floating point numbers that exactly mirrors, that exactly mirrors what first order deduction is doing. And now because every continuous function on reals can be approximated to any degree of precision by a neural network, they've shown that in principle, a neural network can do first order deduction. So this, I think this, this is the first proof that this kind of stuff was possible. But of course it doesn't really show a practical method because what you're relying on here is you're storing your entire set of ground atoms in a single floating point number, right? And each further ground atom is using more and more of the precision. So you'd have to have extraordinary amount of precision to store it. So it, it doesn't um, suggest a practical algorithm, but I think it was the first um, proof of concept that neural networks would be able to do first order inference. And then Serafini and Garcet had a method for doing abduction using neural networks. So given a set of rules and a set of consequences, what set of atoms could have produced those consequences? Again, they have a simple way of uh, representing the um, consequence operator in a continuous fashion. 
And now the stuff that I've been talking about today is an example of first-order induction using neural networks. And there's other work. So there's, uh, there's the Neural Theorem Prover by Tim Rockdeschel and Sebastian Rydell. There's a system from people at, um, uh, is it CMU? I think it is. Um, I think it's what's well, Cohen's group, in, Neural LP. So Neural LP only learns single clauses. And Neural Theorem Prover does not learn large programs with predicate invention and recursion all at once. So the differentiable LP system that I've been showing you today, I think, was the first system that can learn recursive programs with predicate invention using neural networks. And recently, there's been a new paper uh, called Diflog, which has just uh, been submitted to NIPS, which extends these ideas and can learn larger programs using Newton's method, which I think is also very promising. So just to summarize, so I've been talking today about neural program synthesis, right? So this is a, a method that tries to combine the advantages of inductive logic programming with the advantages of neural networks. So it has low sample complexity, so it only needs a few examples. It can learn interpretable rules, but it's robust to mislabeled data and crucially robust to ambiguous input. And it can be integrated and chain, chained with other larger neural network systems. You can plug convolutional neural networks in as input. I've argued that data log is a particularly appropriate choice of a target language for program synthesis systems because it's referentially transparent and it's highly expressive. And I've described one way for a neural network to induce programs from examples. So we convert the induction problem into a SAT problem, and then we neuralize this approach, replacing the discrete operations with differentiable operations, and then we train using stochastic gradient descent. All right, thanks very much, guys. Thanks for your attention. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of work, Claudia, on lambda calculus as a target language. Yes, there's a, there's a lot of work. In fact, I would say probably more than there is on learning logic programs. So there's a system which you can find and you can play online called Magic Haskeller, okay. which, and another one is called Lambda Squared. There are some very powerful systems for learning lambda calculus programs. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Th that's true. It's still much more expensive because they have to do the different sub something, but you're right about that. But yes, that's absolutely true. So using that approach, they can handle examples of mislabeled data. But what they can't handle, I claim, that you didn't seem to agree, was ambiguous data, f fuzzy data. When they, when they don't know, for it's not that they've got this bit of data and it's discrete, but it's wrongly labeled. It's that you've got, all you've got is a distribution uh, over atom. You don't even know what it is. You're, like, like you cannot plug a, a Stephen Muggleton-style system with a, a vision camera in as its input. It, it wouldn't know what to do. Oh, you can, but the thing is, you could, but what would you do? Would you take the max? I mean, the truth is, when you see one of those things, you don't know... Exactly ex what it is. Yeah, exactly. I'll go back to the image, but yeah. Yeah, exactly. You, you just see some fuzzy array of pixels, right? And you've got some distribution. Well, you th maybe you think it's slightly more likely to be a 4 than a 9, but, it's not, but if you were just to take the max, that would be... You'd be losing a huge amount of information. You don't want to just take the max. So what, what do you do? Seems to me very, very risky to take the max. When you, what you want to, you lose, you're throwing away all the information, well, almost all the information. What, what you have is a distribution. You'd rather want to keep the distribution all the way through the processing. Well, well anyway, <laughs> you, you certainly could take the max. That's true. That's sorry. That's a good point. You could take the max.